Well, I was born in 1920, and in 1921, the family moved to England and came back to Ireland in 19, maybe the beginning of 1926, or the very end of 1925. I was, I don't think I was quite six. I was almost six at the time. And I went to school here in, in the convent school here in Fetid. And I, we had an intermediate school. I think they still have it. An intermediate school after the, after grade six. The average, the average uh, girl at that time in grade six, finished grade six, I think, when they were about, they were almost 14, or they were 14. Um, I went into the intermediate at 12. I was 12 years old. I had done, I had been in school in England before I came here to the babies, and I know, they must have moved me around, I don't know. Was there any particular reason why you, your family went to England? Well, in 1921, I don't know exactly, but my father had always worked for the British, and the British left the town. We had a, this town was a military town, yeah. and they had that big barracks, and it was like a town within a town. And practically everybody in the town, as far as I can imagine, was working in some way or another for, the, for if they had, didn't have a job, from somebody, one of the stores or whatever, they had jobs doing some work for the, in, the, in connection with the barracks. I mean, they, they tell me here, <clears throat> when I hear people speak about it, uh, they had something like five tailors in the town. They were all working. Uh, dressmakers. Um, tradespeople that were needed. On, when, the, when the British left, the economy of the town fell flat in its face. And do you remember what, uh, what skill or profession did your father have? My father was, he was, a, he was just a groom. He was working with horses. And, he, and there were lots of horses to be worked with. And he, um, he must, I, I don't know, but I think he must have gotten a job offer in England right away because we went over to a nice house in, in Hampton Lucy in Warwickshire. And my father was working at, uh, I think it was called Hill House, was the name of And he, then we came back to Ireland. There was still nothing in Ireland. And we opened a store on Main Street, next between Heenhans and, and um, Goods, I think. There was an uncle there, and he was not, but Mrs. Good was his sister. And that was on the square? On, it's, that's on the, it's on the far side of the square when you go into feathers from here. But we didn't do well there either. And then my father was very anxious for us to get a good education. He was always, he had a decent education himself. And he went out to America. And we were supposed to go to America, and we were past the consul and had our passports and everything. My father died. He died in New York. So then my mother didn't go. She said, I know what I have here, but I don't want to go alone, go out there. And tell me yeah, how many siblings were there? Uh, was there? I had, there were four of us. My the eldest was fourteen. My brother was ten. Was no, my brother was twelve. May was fourteen. Tim twelve. I was ten, and my younger sister was three. And I went to school to May was in was in the intermediate school at the time and at that time, and I was in grade five. 
So when, then I went into the intermediate when I was finished grade six. And then, and I was always had the notion I wanted to be a nun. Even and at that, uh, even, at that age. even then, yeah, I did. I used where, to get up. Where did that come from? Do you think? Well, we used to get up and go to mass every day, and we had nuns coming into the school on a fairly regular basis from different missions, and they were they were canvassing to get past to get girls that were interested because they tell you the work they were doing in the mission and so on. And they had training houses either in Ireland or they had them in England. So that, it was an idea that was encouraged. And some of the girls from this, from this convent school here had already gone to join the group that I eventually, eventually joined. And they... Uh, and so, sort of, some of them already came back on a holiday. And there was an opportunity for me to go at that time. There was, there were three others, others that were going. And there was a couple of nuns traveling with them. And... Even though I hadn't finished my high school, they would let me finish my high school over there before I entered. And that was one of the things my mother wanted. My mother did not want me to enter any convent at 15. <laughs> and, um, and it was because there were two of the sisters from that, our group and three of other girls that were going, they, my mother, she allowed me to go. I was able to talk her into that. Like as a fifteen-year-old, you were, like your your personality was was very much developed that way, and your a lot of your thinking, and, you know, it was going to affect the rest of your life. So, what, what kind of a feathered environment did you actually leave that you remember? What's, can you can well, you develop it a little? My father had two sisters that were t national school teachers, and I had, I was the last, for about three years, not the last year, but the previous three years after, before that, I had lived with, I slept at my aunt's house. Her husband had died, and she wanted one of us to sleep in, the, sleep in her house because she didn't want to be alone. And um, she taught in Clinine, in that one-room school that they had at those days. Now, so that the idea of becoming a teacher was always there and more or less expected. Um, I had another, she had a, a, another aunt, my Aunt Mary. She was, she had already died, but she was also a national school teacher. So, and it was, you went to, I used to go to Mass every morning. And I was listening to Aunt Annie, you know, although she never, she never, nobody ever mentioned to me, nobody ever said to me, what, uh, uh, do, uh, do you think you'd like to be a nun? Never said that. Did anybody say to me, uh, you know, to be nice if you entered a convent? I never got that. No, no, no. I know, I know there were, I know of nuns in Ireland that got that kind of push, push from home. I never did. I never did. No. No, I just did it on my own. I loved the Abbey. I still love the Abbey. I love to come back to the Abbey. Um, and after my mother died, I think my mother became very religious. She used to go to Mass every day. Sorry, after your father died. After my father, yeah. After losing my father and that, she... she um, and we she'd say the rosary with us in the evening if we were going to go out to something 
but we never never go out too, and we were never allowed out too too late. But we said the rosary before we went out, so that there was religion. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. And sometimes people like find that oppressive because at that time I remember as a, as yeah. a child, you know, having to say the rosary and it was a you have to go to be on your knees and it went on mm-hmm. so long. And, and to mm-hmm. a child it's quite boring and it's you know it's repetitive. And did you not react that way at all to it, or how, did you just accept it, or did you, you could hardly? Uh, you hardly could say you liked the prayer side of it at that point in your life. Well, there was no pressure on me to go to Mass every day. There was no pressure, no pressure from my mother on that at all. I just got up and went. And I always, um, like I would decorate a shrine to Our Lady uh, for the month of May in my mother's bedroom and nobody in the house laughed at me but they would tease me if I were mean today but they didn't I just did it nobody said anything they didn't you know that's what she does um so that they they might not have been too surprised when I decided what I did to do what I you obviously had a you had a love for that yeah And my mother, when it was a, economically, it was a bad time because she had four children, and she didn't want her big worry at the time was was she wanted to keep May in high school. There was no free high school in Ireland at that time. I don't think you got free high school in Ireland until around 1960. And so my aunt, the one that was the teacher, she had no children, and her husband had died. So she said, I'll pick up school fees. And that was one, my mother's, one of my mother's big worries. She wanted to keep us. Because the nuns, were, the, the nuns were looking to try and get a job for my sister May um, at 14. Well, when she was, yeah, she was 14. They were sent for my mother, and they thought that May would be, uh, would, could, would, uh, could get a, maybe a nice job as a, ho- as a priest's housekeeper. Oh, my mother was insulted. Oh, she was upset. <laughs> she said, if I wanted May to be priest's housekeeper, or anybody's housekeeper, I would have kept her home and trained her myself. But she yes. was very upset about that. Yes. Anyway. But that was a, the nuns were just trying to figure out. But she managed. She was a marvelous cook. She made meals out of next to nothing. What people would throw away, I think. <laughs> but and what, what, was, what was her income, or how did she survive when your dad had, had died? Well, I think there was there was a, a uh, there there had to be at that time. I think a a um, a widow's per- pension, and that that was based, I think, on the number of children that were were. Uh, I, but it might have been that they were a number of children that couldn't work, but you could work at fourteen. Oh, yes. <laughs> so it wasn't an awful lot of money. Um, but my. My, there were two aunts that came to the rescue a bit in different ways. And she took care of an old lady across the street that had money. And one of the businessmen in the town um, had her money and had charge of it. And she was a little bit demented. And Dr. Stokes was a doctor at the time. And he came to my mother and he said... Uh, uh, this lady is. Uh, she should. He said, "I'll have to to get her into a home." Uh, he said, "Because she's not able to take care of herself." 
and he said, like you and other people, and you're know, just helping, bringing her back in when she's not properly dressed and so forth. But he, then he told her that uh, Paddy Heenan was a merchant here in the town, and he, he has her money, and he, uh, so she doesn't need to go to a nursing home if somebody here will take, will, can take care of her. So my mother said, yes, she would do it. So that gave her something. She was allowed a certain amount of money for taking care of her. Imagine it wasn't much because the salaries weren't much. But she was also allowed some money for food for this woman. <coughs> <coughs> and that was, that was a help. Uh, she used to knit things for people. And my older, my sister, my older sister used to might knit the back of the might knit the back of a of a sweater, and my, my mother would do the front. They both have to do this. The, one would have to do the two the two sleeves, but that was you know it was just. And we had a garden <coughs> and chickens. And where was your house at that time? Oh, it's just on Barrick Street. It's still there. When you go down Barrick Street from here, just beyond the, the, Protestant, the Protestant schoolhouse and what was that property, there are three houses there. The first one has been enlarged, and there's something, there's a tall section in, towards the back. <coughs> that was the Miss Corcoran's, and ours was the middle one. And the next one was the McInerney's, Jimmy McInerney, if you might know. Yeah, well, they were they were in that house. There's an extension on that house that it's not an it's not a complete house, but there is a piece added on there, and that has been done recently, I think. The houses were owned by Mickey Bow, who was McEn Mrs. McInerney's uncle, and they were Mickey Bow and his sister Anne were across the street. So you, you actually rented the house, is that right? It was rented. We never, but as I, as far as I know, my father was born in that house. So the, it's an old house. Hmm. <coughs> just, just go on then about going to AM. My father was born in eighteen seventy-two. Said so no, eighteen eighteen seventy-eight, I think. He died at 52 in 1930. So that would be about right. Yeah. <clears throat> and uh, just to talk about the, uh, when you went to America then, was that... When what? I went out to America... What had you in your mind going on? What did you, did you actually expect? Or were you excited about... The idea of travel, or was it education, or was it being a nun, or what was the, the big well, thing? Well, I, I, want, I wanted to be a teacher, and I wanted to finish, I, well, the big, at the time it was to finish, get my high school finished, because I promised my mother I would not enter until I had finished my high school. And I took two years to finish high school up over there because the system is altogether different. When you, you, when you finish <clears throat> here, you took your exams at the end of four years. Uh, you took the exams on everything that you, all the subjects that you had in high school. But, you, but in the States, you can take a one-year course in something, take the Regents exam, and then you finish that. And you can go to like a, an entirely different branch of math. You can go, for example, to, to um, geometry and do a year of geometry and take the regions and you get your regions credit for that. So that counts as another credit. You might do advanced algebra and do your regions and that's finished. Whereas here you're doing, you're doing all of that, the four year bunch of that at one time. So you end, you end up with very little to show when you go over with three years of high school, unless they just you tell them what you did. 
And I was in a school, I was in a private school the first year, and run by nuns, and a Lady of Wisdom Academy. And I, they never, they never took the, the list of information on me, and they never sent it to Albany to get it evaluated, and they'd get a reply to say, uh, she needs this, this, and this. <clears throat> they were just telling me what I would have to do, and I was doing whatever I could. So I was in seven classes every day. Well, you haven't got time to do seven, the work for seven classes every night. And the second year I went to public school. I was in that school maybe not two weeks. And the principal called me in and he had a letter for me from Albany telling me exactly what I had, what I was getting credit for, what I still needed. And I finished at the end of that year. So then, I, so in the meanwhile, I used to go and visit one of the girls that was a very good friend of my sister, who was in class with my sister. She's sort of related to Larry. Um, by marriage, it's, it's, it, she, was, she was, her mother was O'Brien, her father, but her uh, father was Power, but she was a big friend and I liked her. And I was very interested when she went. Uh, and I used to talk to her mother and ask her mother how she's doing this and this. So that was, I think that was what made me think then like, I might go there. But I used to stop in to see her once in a while. So when I was finished, I was 1937. I uh, went down and I told, told them I would met the, told the Reverend Mother that I'd like to come. And oh, she talked to me a little while and asked me all kinds of questions. But anyway, in the end, she said, "Oh yes, yes, yes." And I, I, I've never regretted it. Haven't you? No, I've never regretted it. It was there were there were good days, there were good there were good times and not so good times. But there was always those magic moments that make up for that. I think there's that in every life where you... Um, so Then I, I... She sent me to college. She sent me to the university. We call it college here in, in the States. She sent me as a companion for one of the nuns. That The nuns were not allowed to travel alone. They had to have somebody with them. And um, this sister wanted to go to Fordham University. She had been at St. John's and apparently didn't like it. And they were letting her move to switch. And she had to have a companion to travel with her. So the superior uh, said to me, I think you, sh you, you go along as, with, as her, to, for her companion. You like books, you know, you, you so do this. So that year I did eight courses, four in, the, four in the fall and four in the spring. So that gave me sort of a something else. Then I went in the novitiate um, after that you second year the, my second year you don't study. That's really um, to get you steeped in the prayer life and so on. And then there was a requirement in the diocese for all their teachers, they had to do what they called three years of normal school. The normal school was teacher training. So I went through that. And when I finished that, they sent me back to Fordham again to pick up. And it was part-time because I was, also, I, I was teaching. And so... I, I majored in mathematics. I was good in math. I liked math, and I did math, and I did, I guess it did maybe three years of French, and already had had three years of French in high school. So it was like a, it was a, like a minor. So now when I finished, 
when I finished the with when I when I finished the bachelor's degree, <coughs> I they they said, well, keep you know continue to get get a master's in something, and I said, well, I'd like to get a master's in physics, because I thought that was possible with my back my math background. And I started working on that, and I had done a year and one summer on that, and I was asked to go, I was transferred, I was asked, well, I was asked if I would go to West Hartford. We had opened a school in West Hartford, and um, the, just the year before. Otherwise, this is our first, this was the first school we had in Connecticut. We had we had the, whatever we had we had in New York in the New York area, and Long Island. <clears throat> so, one of the nuns had a heart attack, and they didn't think she was going to uh, be able to go back to school, maybe ever. And that's true; she never did. And um, they said, "Would I go up for a year and take her place, and they'd see what they could do by next year?" And I went up for one year, and they left me there ten and a half years. And I taught up there, um, and I liked it. I, I took some courses in, and I couldn't take any more courses in, my phys in physics because they wanted full-time, they wanted people who were full-time. So I, they wanted, but they also asked me to do some other science because they were, they, if they needed me in high school, I would be more useful if I had, for example, biology. And I had had no biology. I never had any biology except whatever I had in the convent school here with Miss Flood. We had a Miss Flood. And I think it was that course that sort of made me interested in science. I was fascinated with uh, all this glassware and all this, all the stuff we were doing with Miss Flood. And so then, all of a sudden, they remembered me. And they called and said, uh, you know, <laughs> it, will you go back and finish your master's? So I said, not, uh, not in physics. I've been away from physics for 10 years. And what has happened in physics is phenomenal in those years. And so I um, went back and picked up biology, and I got a doctorate in biology. I got the master's, then I went on, stayed on, and got the doctorate in biology. So that was mine. So what, what age were you at that point? At that point, when I got my doctorate, I was 44. And had your mother died in Ireland by then? My mother had died in England during the war. <clears throat> my mother had gone to England because May, had my sister, had gone to England to get a job, and my brother had gone to England to work, and he joined the Royal Marines, and so he was in the war at that time. And my mother was here by herself, and one of my father's sisters, the last of my father's sisters, was um, living, so she lived in that house until she died sometime around, I don't, I'm not sure, maybe 44, 44 or 45. And... And then, like, before your mother died, she must have been very proud of the level of education that you had achieved, because obviously well, I hadn't, you could never have imagined to have been as qualified as you ended up. With. I don't think she knew. I don't think I ever wrote home and told them what what I was doing regarding school. We were allowed... Communications were very slow during the war, and we were allowed to write a number of letters in, in the novitiate. Now, I was out of the novitiate by that time. But in the novitiate, um, up until 19, 1940, 
between 37 and 40. Uh, we could write, I think, four times a year. Um, we didn't receive mail during Lent. We didn't receive mail during Advent. You got your bundle of mail at Christmas because whatever came in uh, during and the same thing for Easter. So those were the rules. Those were the way things were done. I think that's pretty much the same in most communities. And did you find that harsh? Yeah, there were times when uh, there isn't much you can do. But anyway, that's one, well, that's one of the sacrifices. <laughs> yeah, you leave home. You see that the the people. I think the nuns that left home at that time left home forever. And most of the nuns that were in the convents didn't go home. We, when, I first, when I first went, the, the, it, the idea, we, were, we, were, we, we knew we would not go, ever go home. And then after the war, some of the nuns who had been there had been in a long time, ahead of me, were allowed to go home once. And then my turn finally came up, and in 1950. So I was in since 1937, so 1950. Uh, that's a lot of years to bridge. But I went home at that time, and I was told it was this one and only lift. Uh, so as far as I was concerned at that time, um, it was like a long week. <laughs> and then, then, then it became, you could go home every 10 years. Just go back to that one. How, how long did you stay at home at that time? Well, they, when, you, they left, when they laid us home, left us a long time, uh, when we went home, we, went, we were, could stay for five weeks. Um, and that home at that spot, uh, was that home to England now or home to Ireland? That was home to England, which which wasn't home to you. Yeah, it wasn't home to me. And um, at the time, nobody we we all of us that got that length of time. The Irish were luckier than I was, because some of them had big families and extended family, and so on. And I didn't. I, I didn't, and I thought. And it was, things were rationed in England still, quite, quite strict rationing in England at the time. But everybody, my, especially my brother, was wonderful. Anyway, that... Then it was every five years if your pa parents were living. And I hadn't either parents. But then by the time, by 65, I was allowed to go. And I went again in 70. And it was after 70 and after Vatican II that things began to change a bit. So... For a long number of years then, you were part of a community and you were a teacher. I was. I was teaching, I was teaching one of our, I was teaching at first in one of our parish schools. And what, uh, what age groups were you teaching? The age? Yeah. I taught my first class, um, I taught for, the, the, for one year from 43 to 44. And and then I went back to Blue Point. Blue Point was our our uh, central, our main home. That was the novitiate. They brought me back, and I was there from forty four to forty six. And it was in forty six that I went out uh, and to Howard Beach again. No, no, I didn't. <laughs> I went to one of our schools. I went to, for the one year, I went to one a school we had in Ozone Park. And 
they brought me back and kept me at Blue Point for another two years. And then I went out to Howard Beach, Our Lady of Grace in Howard Beach. And I taught there from, 40, from 46 to 49. And it was in 49 that I went up to replace the nun in, in West Hartford, Connecticut. Who had who got sick and they then they were they forgot about me and left me there. And I in 1960, in January of 1960, I came back down to Ford. Did you have a favourite? Um, did you did, were they all girls schools, or were they mixed? The girls the, the schools I was teaching in. Yeah. Oh no, they were mixed. Oh, right. They were boys and girls. They were parish schools. Okay. Yeah. And. and um, was there an age group that you enjoyed teaching? I I enjoyed well. I enjoyed the fifth grade, the seventh grade. I did that for. I did that probably for seven years, seven and a half years. Yeah, and I had taught. There were two groups that I had taught already in grade five that I met again in grade seven. And um, that was a big help for me, but it was also a big help for them because I knew them and I knew the weaknesses and the strengths and so on. I met, I was down in, at, this doesn't, doesn't belong in the, but I was down at um, NIH, the National Institutes of Health in Washington, D.C., doing some research. And I... Went down. I was learning. I had. I was. I had just learned how to, to work with electron microscopy. Do to do electron microscopy, and I was doing electron electron microscopy, right? Electron microscopy on a piece of work that I had already done the light microscopy of, and I wanted to do the electron microscopy and see if the whole thing would jet, would correspond, and there were two men at the end of the hall just before I turned into the. And just as I was turning into the lab, one of them said, Sister Petra. And it was Jimmy Missett. Jimmy Missett, I had taught him in, in West Hartford. And he was in medical school at the time. And um, he said, what are you doing here? And I said, I'm, I'm working on doing some work with ele in electron microscopy. And he said, he turned to the other doctor that he was with. She was he said she was the best math teacher in the country. <laughs> I said, oh, he couldn't believe that I would leave it. But uh, you get little bits of encouragement every once in a while that you didn't expect. Anyway, the, so I was doing research and teaching I taught at two different universities. I taught at St. John's for three years. The first teaching job I got uh, was St. John's. And I got that in 64, in the fall of 64. I really wanted, I wanted to get a, and I, I wanted to get a, um, a postdoc, what we call a postdoc. You probably know it's a, it's to continue doing research in your line um, after you get the doctorate, so that you sort of get your research established. You can, it gives you another bump ahead, and most of the younger people that's what they try to do and get if they can get one or two years of postdoc and then worry about the teaching bit. So when you, the superior didn't want me to do research, she wanted me to teach. So I got a job at St. John's. And I stayed at St. John's for three years and I didn't like it. And uh, my, they, you, you got a one year contract. And so my third year contract was renewed. I was, I was there three years. I had, a, and I, the, the contract was renewed for the fourth year. But I waited uh, for some time I let it go to almost the last minute when it was due. And I checked with the provincial and I said to her, I don't want to stay there. And she said, you never, wanted, you never did want to be there. She said, so she said, in God's name, just 
can just resign. So I resigned. And I, but I said to her, I don't have any, any job. She said, oh, you'll get, you'll get something. Don't, go, don't worry about that. So, and to my surprise, I got hired at Fordham. And I was there. I'm still, I'm still living close by, but <clears throat> that was uh, 67. And I, I retired. I was part-time for the last 14 years in my last job. But I was, so for the last 14 years, I retired from that in August, in October, no, in August, 31st of August of last year, of 2012. And uh, so then, when, so they said to me, try to get into that building. And uh, we'd like to have you stay on campus because everybody knows you. And we like that, that presence on the campus. Unless, if, if it's okay with the superior, unless the superior wants you to go down to the old folks' home, but, but we don't think you're ready for the old folks' home. So the superior said to me, no, no, no. She said, do whatever, it's okay. I was able to go in. So I went in there in September of last year. Well, I was happy. I was very happy in biology. I was 20 years in biology. Um, but by that time, the 20 years in biology, I was, uh, that was 87, 87. So I was 67, right? I took the job, then they needed somebody to be the dean of the summer school. And the summer school had eight schools under one umbrella. And the man who had done it for, they, were, they had unified all the schools. The only one not underneath that, um, under that umbrella was School of Law and the Graduate School of Business. But all the other graduate schools and the undergraduate schools were all under one umbrella. And they had just unified that whole thing. And so the person that was really the, the, uh, was, that was supposed to do it, he died very suddenly. And they called on me, would I do it? And I said, I'll do it for, just for the year. Would I, and give them a chance. So I did it for the year. And at the end of the year, I, they didn't like, they had a search and they didn't like the results of the search. And they said to me, Will you, would you reconsider and do it? And I said, yeah, let me sleep on it. And I began to think, if I stay, if I go back to biology, um, I am 68, and in two years' time, I'll have to retire because retirement was required at 70. So without saying a word to anybody, I went back and I said, yeah, I'll, I'll do it. Um, I'll, uh, because by that time, too, I was glad to have a job where I could sit down uh, and what I didn't finish today, I could attack it maybe a bit earlier tomorrow. Two hours of lecture, followed by four hours of laboratory. And you were on your feet, I figure, for the best part of seven, good seven hours, maybe more. And I didn't, I didn't miss, I missed the contact with the kids, with the students, but at the same time, I, it was ever so much easier. So I, there's, I designed what I had to do with all these schools. I planned it. I went to the archives and I researched what those, each of those schools were doing in the summer, what the attendance was for Dr. So-and-so, so-and-so. And then I issued contracts depending on how they performed in those courses. And I would get course, in the beginning, I would get a call saying, I'm a full professor. 
I get a lot of students. And I say, well, just a minute. In 19, and I'd give them maybe the last five years. <laughs> and I would say, I'll give you a contingency contract. I can't give you an absolute contract. I'll give you a contingency contract. Oh, but you don't give, give full professors. Oh, I said, I do. <laughs> so, anyway, it worked. It worked. The, and they were delighted. I mean, they, 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 everything went very nicely. So I, went, I did that for 12 years, and then I, thought, then I thought, well, by that time, I was at Fordham 12 more years, so it was 98. And I reti retired in 98. And I got called in, what are you going to do? I said, I didn't think I had to do anything at this hour of my life. And they said, oh, yes, you're not ready for a retirement home. I said, I know that. Uh, but uh, so I said, I'll... Um, I said, tell me what you have in mind. And they said, well, we have about 130, maybe 135 uh, retired faculty out there. And the only people they're in touch with are the secretaries in human resources. But it, we really sh would, would like to have a, a, one of their own, one of the peer, a peer person. And we think you're just the right one. You know a lot of people. You have been in a lot of different positions. You have been on a lot of committees. You know the statutes. I had been president of the faculty senate along the line when I, when in, uh, in 77 I got elected. I was the first woman elected to, the, to, the, to that job. And so they figured, so I did, so I said, okay, it's a part-time job. Uh, you can fix your own hours, you will arrange your own hours and so on. So I took it and I did it for 14 years. And 14 years were up just less. I loved that last job, it was really uh, easy and nobody bothered me. Nobody, nobody was, I had nobody checking on me, you know, on a regular basis. They just, I was just there. But I must say, I did enjoy, I enjoyed it. I think most of the work I've done that I've ever gotten, even though were, some of them jobs were, that I got in the community were different, were not what I was, I think God has been very good to me. I, I can do it the best way I can, do the, make the best of it. You started out with a very simple faith, I understand, you know, it's, mm, yeah. it's a very simple yeah. understanding of God and, and, and faith. Yeah. And, and, um, but when you went through, the, you became very well educated in the sciences, in biology and physics, so you would have, you would have um, had to challenge a lot of church the theology, I, I presume, and, and your, 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 your understanding and your belief in your God and your, the, the God that you believed in from in the beginning must have developed to some extent. So can you talk about yeah, that? Yeah, it is still being developed. Um, the, we, had, we had rules, we had times in the community. We had rules with regard to the time you got up. Um, then we had prayers in the chapel. We had morning prayer. We had a half an hour's meditation. Uh, we might have had another quarter of an hour before it was time for mass. And usually in the local parish, if you didn't have mass in the convent, it was either one or the other. But you might get your rosary said during Sorry. that period. Sorry. Just fell down. Okay. Um, and you went, went to Mass, then you came back, and you had, um, you came back from Mass, you had your breakfast, just, you all ate together, and we might, we'd chant little hours before we went over to school. So that morning was, there were prayers, specified prayers. Now when you're on your own, you do those prayers by yourself. 
um, I had the advantage, uh, it was a disadvantage in some respects uh, at St. John's because at that time in St. John's, they, it was difficult for me to get to Mass every day. Whereas in Fordham, I had lots of opportunity to go to Mass. There would be a choice of maybe five different Masses that I could get to. And there were, they also, we had lectures and we had, there were opportunities to pick up things that broadened you. And, and I was always curious about this or that. And then when I, if I had the time, even though I was in biology, I would have time to go to a philosophy lecture or go over to a, a lecture in the, in uh, uh, theology or, we had a religious ed school. I didn't do very much with them. They were, too, but I did it a lot with either philosophy and theology. But, and also, we were surrounded. We had so many Jesuits in those days. There was always a conference that you could go to, and they did provide special conferences for the nuns. If we had, in the summertime, especially, we had a lot of nuns that were studying. And there was, there would be a, on a Friday afternoon, there was always a special conference for the nuns. And so on. So that in many ways, when you're on your own, at least my experience of that, was I was praying for the first time. I wasn't praying because I was answering a bell. I was praying because I needed that prayer to keep going. And I, I learned different ways of praying. I got a lot of, I did a lot of, of uh, sadhana. I don't know if you've, no, I don't know. do you ever hear of Tony DeMello? Mm -hmm. Tony DeMello, he was a, a um, he was a Jesuit, an Indian Jesuit, who really combined methods of prayer that are, typical of of the their of their culture but c combined with christianity and so uh, and there was the office to be said and we were doing the office of our of the rest of virgin mary well, eventually, I was pick, i had the office i got the the four volume one that the priests all say the one for each season. And um, lately, I'm, and as the time goes on, your prayer changes. And I sometimes think when we develop our own religion, regardless of all the, the directions. And I was talking to one of the priests about that just recently. He said, we all do that. When we get older, we have we have our own method. And lately, I've been picking up Celtic spirituality, picking up as much as I can find on that. And um, I think it's a pity that that got pushed aside in in um, in place of what was coming from Rome. And. I think it's beautiful. Can you give me some kind of an example of what you're talking about? Or just, are you talking about moving away from rigid, rigid teachings? Or Not yet? from religious teaching, no. But from methods. Um, I get more at it when I sit down now. When I sit down and just look at the stars and look at the clouds and look at the mountain and look at the trees and listen to the birds even the little creepy crawly things uh, God made them all and um, they all in their own way do what they were created to do and man seems to be the only animal that is trying to get away from that uh, And so you can, 
You can glorify God and thank God. I thank God every day for the day because every day is a gift right now. At 93, every day is a gift. There's a book that was, I would think is, it's one of the most bestseller for a long time, Anamkara, A-N-N-A-M-Kara, the Gaelic. It's like the, the soul, dear, the dear soul or the, friend, the soul of a friend. Of, and I was first, I met the word a soul friend some years ago in England. <laughs> it's funny where you meet things. Um, this, there was a lady that used to come in to play cards with my sister, and I was over in England visiting at the time, and I was in playing cards also. But I was not staying with my sister, I was staying with my niece. And this lady gave me a lift to my niece on the way home. She, she was, rather than let me call my niece and come and get me. And I said to her, how do you know me? How do you know my sister? Because my sister wasn't living down in Dorset uh, all that long time. She was most of, she had most of it, her, her life was in Old Windsor. And so she said, well, she said, I met her in church. And she said, it's not easy to find a soul friend in England. She said, but I found a soul friend in May. And I thought, oh, isn't that nice? I never knew May was that good. But anyway, so then I came across this soul friend bit in some of my readings. And within the last several years, I've picked up more and more of it. And um, he, the, he, he writes, this man was also a poet. And he writes some beautiful pieces. And Echoes of Memories is a book of, of, uh, of his that's poetry. And it's beautiful. It's beautiful. I have a different focus on prayer. Uh, but it doesn't matter whether I'm praying in bed or whether I'm praying in, on the street. It can be prayer. I think as, as you go along, you have to have conversations with Jesus. Like I'll say, you know, what's going on? What did you What did you do that for? The Jewish people used to argue with God. They, and they were always asking for signs. I don't believe in asking for signs, but they did. They did look for signs, but they also abused. Was almost abuse. What you, why did you do this to us? Why did you take us out of Egypt? You brought us out here to die, to die of starvation. What kind of a God are you? Where's your promise? You promised, you promised us this and you promised us that and you're not coming across with it. And I think God likes that. It's only he likes. I think God likes us to be friend, to talk to him as we would to a good friend. Right. No, no, it's not negative. It's what you could say to a real good friend. And it's so, and I'm, I've kept in touch with the community. I've always gone to meetings. I've taken part in whatever was being done for elections or whatever. And um, I wasn't always able to be there all the time for some celebrations because of my work. But uh, I'm a respectable member of the community <laughs> of the order. Now, what I didn't tell you anything about was the Ursulines of Tildong. Yes. We are Ursulines of Tildong. Tildong being the name of the village Impressive. where it was started. And it was started after the French Revolution because most of the churches were closed down and schools were closed and so forth. And the cure there started with a group of women that were willing to help out and teach religion to the kids and to help here and there. And then they wanted, to, they, it, it, that developed into a, a religious order. They were trained by the Ursulines in Bordeaux, who had been revived after the French Revolution. 
and um, and it became a very. It spread all over all over uh, Belgium, but also the Netherlands, the Dutch East Indies. Um, in 19, and I think over through down through Czechoslovakia, that part of, of uh, Central Europe. In 1912, no, in 19, 19 1902, I think it was, they, op they started a mission in India. We have about 700 nuns in India that are sisters of Tilda. And why, why do you think it was, it was so well established or became so well established in India? Well, the Jesuits were out there, they were, the Jesuits were in that part, this, the part of India where we started in Ranchi. And apparently it was a very poor area where we had people up in the hills and the mountains and they uh, were not, they were get, not getting anything. And the nuns went out. The nuns were teachers. But when they got there, they said, we need more than teachers. There was, so they, some of them went in for nursing and uh, meeting whatever was needed at the time. So they started a lace, a lace school. They started a, a, which has become lace and embroidery, still in existence to help them get make, make a little money. Uh, that also has helped support this mission because the, some of the things are sent back to, in, to Belgium and are sold, and that provides the money for the, for the, for the uh, mission. The, um, they were teaching in the school, and as they went along, they found, well, we need nurses, so they trained to become nurses. And right now we have a whole a number of them. Are we have a number of doctors? There was one over here just a few, a few weeks ago. She's a pharmacist. Um, they've been all over. They've studied in different parts of the world, so they're not just studying in India. That's a very that has, has been a very successful mission. The, we have a mission in the Congo. That has been touch and go, but it's apparently right now we have maybe about 80 nuns there. I remember when I was first professed, the day after my profession, the superior uh, called me and she said, would you be terribly disappointed if you didn't go out to Howard Beach to teach? I had been told like two weeks before or three weeks before that I'd be going to Howard Beach. And I said, oh, I don't care what I do. And so she gave me something else to do. She said, I need, I need a cook. And so I cooked. <laughs> and how long did you cook? Five years. Um, I wasn't going to tell you this, but <laughs> I skipped it. Um, I was professed in 1940. And... She, what she said to me was, I have to take Sister Vincent to Canada. We have houses in Canada. Um, I have to take Sister Vincent tomorrow to, um, to Canada, she said, up to Manitoba. She said, because Sister so-and-so is very ill, and she's the sister that was their cook, and they have a boarding school, and it's time this boarding school will be opened in another couple of weeks. And she said, I have nobody that can run the kitchen. And they didn't, I guess they didn't have enough money to hire somebody to do it. So I said to her, I know nothing about it. Oh, she said, there's a novice there that has been helping sister. And she knows the amounts. But she said, I can't leave a novice in charge of the kitchen. So I said, okay, okay. So I did, but I also studied on weekends. I used to, Friday afternoon, I'd go into New York and I'd come back late on Saturday. Uh, so that I was able to continue some studies during that period. And um, Did you feel forgotten about? Hmm? 
did you feel forgotten about because no, it had no, gone on for so many, no, many years? No, I didn't. I didn't. I never felt forgotten about because you were, you, they were around all the time. <laughs> so I was sent out in '43. After three years, I went out to teach because the sister, the supervisor of our schools, one of our own, kept on saying, "She has professed three years. She has never stood in a classroom yet." She has to be, she has to have some teaching experience. So I went to her, I went to her school and I taught for one year, taught grade five. And then when I, and when that was over, they needed me in the kitchen again. And I was there until 46. And in 46, the, the war was over and the superior general came over to visit the American houses and the Canadian houses, and she meets me uh, there. And we used to play games, like we'd play drafts or whatever, and so on. And she had, she had little puzzles. She had, she, she, she had uh, sheets of paper that were drawn in with all kinds of geometric figures, and you had to work out the the area of this and this and this and this and so on, and I used to play with this. And so she went to, she went to the superior in Blue Point and she said she shouldn't be in the kitchen. <laughs> so she, she's the one that got me out of the kitchen. And was there no way for you to engineer that? Hmm? Was there no way for you to engineer that change? You must have known you were underused hmm. as far as they are. I mean, you weren't, did you not really? Uh, no. Uh, it wasn't, it, it, no, I felt that I was doing whatever God wanted me to do at the time. And you still feel that? Like, do you, I, I never, I have never, I've never, that, to me that was, it was a difficult experience, but I have been able to live by myself, cook for myself, not feel burdened with having to put a meal together. Um, and I couldn't ever have done that if I hadn't had that that experience, <laughs> because it wasn't I wasn't working in a well-equipped kitchen. I was working with a refrigerator that was a converted icebox, so that it was poverty all around. <laughs> and how many people were you cooking for? About about six, fourteen, sometimes fourteen. I think usually about 18, but on feast days, the people would come down, I'd have 60. <laughs> so you got good practice. <laughs> but you're young, and you're young, and yeah, it's all right. Yeah. Did, you ever, did you ever think about the, the, I suppose, how your life would have gone had you not entered our... Had you, you know, had a family or did that part, did, no, did, did you ever I, dwell on that at any point? I in didn't, life? I guess it was something that you're just better off not to dwell on. But I think there were some things, because of the way we were dressed, a lot of stuff was in the way. That's how I got out of, out of the habit. We used to wear a, a bib, mm. we used to call it a gamp. And they were starched. The hours we spent at an ironing board, starching and ironing. And then on top of that, then we got these in plastic that looked like linen. And the professor that he said, "Oh man, you're going to have to do something. That has to go." And I knew what he meant because I had seen the face of one of the nuns. I was boarding with the Sisters of Mercy, and there was a sister there who, when she went to blow out vigilites in the chapel, it, her, this camp took fire, and her whole face was burnt. She was, looked awful. So it, it must have made a huge difference to you when you, took, when you, when you, when you stopped using the habit, because all of a sudden... Well, you feel, in the beginning, you feel naked. Yeah. <laughs> um, but I went out of it gradually but I, I was able to use a two piece a, cir a, a, a skirt and a blouse and a, 
a jacket. And, um, and well, the nun who gave the toast at my 70, 75th jubilee last year, she recalled that. And she, because she said, we are, she, she, she was a, a trailblazer. But so you were one of the first to do that? I was the first, yeah. But I did it with permission. I got permission to do it. Um, it was like an experiment. But they were... <laughs> In any case, I think most of the nuns... The what we were wearing wasn't suitable for the work we were doing, apart from me and the, and the science bit. We were traveling on the subways and we were in a, in, a, in this habit that was down to the down to your ankles down to your almost to your toes we were wiping the stairs of the subways you could pick them up to you know to some extent but when you sat down in the subway all of that was on the floor it was but, but as well as that like did you did you feel more did you feel almost more religious when you had it? I didn't feel any more religious with it, but I think that people, a lot of people had a hard time accepting it. And when they'd find out you were a nun, they said, why don't you wear a habit? And I used to say, sometimes I think you should wear a habit and know what it's like. Because in the summertime, we roasted. In the wintertime, we froze. Like, if, if, you, if you were to talk to a girl of your age, when you joined, like a, a 17-year-old, 18-year-old today, like, like what kind of advice would you, would you give them? I would tell her, <clears throat> get as much education as you can get. And if she doesn't want to do that or can't afford to do that, go out to work and work for a few years. And if you still feel like that again, come back. Or in between, come back. Because I think kids that grow up, they grown, have grown up at, at home. And 90% 90 90 of the time, everything is done for them. And when they want to unless they're unusual, they're going to talk it, talk if they have plans or they'd like to do something, they'll talk it over with their mother or, or an older sister or whatever. Um, but they have to learn to do things for themselves and they have to learn to think for themselves. And also, um, They have to pick their friends, pick the right friends. We pick our friends, we don't pick our families. And so we have to, some, some of the mistakes that kids make, college kids and or high school kids, they, they, they hook up with the wrong kid. They, don't, they really don't, don't think. So I think work experience makes them more realistic about what life is about, and then try. People, those are, anybody that's entering now, as far as I know, they're older. They're older, or they're people that are already in one profession, and all of a sudden, they, they'll, or not maybe all, all of a sudden, but then, but they, they change. I'm seeing priests. We have a priest at Fordham who was a lawyer, and had a good law practice became a judge, and then came into the priesthood. We have doctors. We have MDs who've gone through all of that medical school and um, have gotten into the priesthood. And you feel they're much better for that? Oh, I think it's better because... Otherwise, they're always depending on Reverend Mother. 
Reverend Mother said this, Reverend Mother said that. Well, you know, Reverend Mother is not God. <laughs> but it was, it was almost like, well, she couldn't, she couldn't make a mistake. It calls the people in charge have to be people that are smart enough and educated enough to appreciate that somebody is different, that this one's talents are not being used, that this one would, would you know, find out does she really, does she like what she's doing? It, it, it requires a rather liberal a person who is intelligent and liberal to some extent, at least. Not, you, not that you're throwing away the basics, but you can still keep the basics. But we were all, we, when, when I entered, you did whatever Reverend Mother asked you to do. I mean, you didn't, it was yes. Everything was yes. Now, and I, I fear, I look around at any of the new, new sisters, the new orders, and some of them are new orders, but people that are getting them, they're all people who are still in the habit. They're the, most, most of the people, the very few of the others are getting, getting. So the church, the, the church is still putting pressure on the habit. Yeah, there is. There's no doubt about it. And you see that as a mistake? I think it's, well, if, I'm not inside one of these orders at the moment, so I don't know. I don't know how liberal or how different they are in their. If they're if they're doing what was done to us, it's wrong. Yeah, if they are, but they mightn't be doing that. But they already have it. But if they have it has to be, if they, if they put them into habits, but I think some of them that are in habits are in habits that are modifications of what they had. They're neither fish nor fowl. You have somebody that has a, uh, a veil of some kind, and she's, whatever, some of the other stuff that she's wearing doesn't go with the veil. It's not suitable for that. It's almost like it. She's almost like a domestic. Um, well, if if what they're wearing is something that identifies them in public, and that is really what they want, I think, if they if it identifies them, provided it is something that's practical for the work they're doing. And let them try it and see how it works. I don't know. Maybe we're going to get an entirely different kind of religious life. It might be come out, there might be something altogether different. But when you go back to the foundresses, Angela never wore a habit, never prescribed a habit. They wore whatever people were wearing, ordinary people were wearing at the time. Um, and lo and behold, as the nuns went along and the numbers grew, they started starching, they started putting lace, uh, decorating, <laughs> and so we began to we began to look like wayside shrines. And I think we had more time. To, I know certainly I know, and I look at our nuns that were in parishes uh, where we did all the starching and the ironing, they had more time to work with kids after school. When I was in teaching, when I was out teaching, we couldn't run an after school program. We hadn't time. And it, it was the time, and not, then not only that, but they, 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 we did an awful lot of work for the church. We used to do the, the altar cloths, the linens, the linens for the church, all of that was extra. The nuns used to do it because I guess they, maybe the churches didn't have the money or 
didn't want to spend the money. I mean, it, <laughs> do we ever, uh, does anybody ever think of the amount of violence that's in our movies, the amount of violence that's in the, the games that they give children to play with, and then we condemn all these other countries for their violence? Just makes sense. <laughs> I wish I were younger. I'd like another 20 years. <laughs> but I'm glad, I'm grateful I'm, that I'm as well as I am. And uh, I thank God every day that uh, I have another day. And what's, how do you feel about that? How do you feel about it? Because you would have, you've lost a lot of friends that have died now over... over I have years. lost a lot of friends. I've lost some of my very close friends. But that's life. I mean, that's just what happens. And I go to a lot of funerals, go to a lot of wakes and funerals. And I was doing a lot of that when I was in the job I was in, the part-time job. It was retired faculty. And some of them got sick and died. What's your, what's your concept of afterlife? Oh, I don't know. I don't know. I read something recently that said there's faith There's faith and love. We're injected when we're born. We're injected with life and with hope. We're injected with life and death because life and death, one is part of the other. One is life and death. And we're also injected with hope that the, that the grave is not the end, that death is not the end. And we go along with hope, and we need a lot of hope. And it's one of the virtues, like we say, faith, hope, and charity, or faith, hope, and love. And the greatest of these is love. Well, you can't do much without hope. It's very important. Very important. And has your faith kind of... What my faith is, I has, hope... Has it risen and dropped and... Oh, yeah. It goes up and down. Sure, sure. I think that's the same with... I think that's... Anybody who thinks. Um, but I remember saying that to one of a spiritual director I had one time, and I said, you know, I don't know if uh, after all this and towing chalk lines according to the rules and so on, after all this, it's, it ends. And that there's really no hereafter that we all think are hoping for. And he said, well, he said, faith has, has to come in there and we have to keep our hope. But he said, even if there is no other, it's been a good life. We have, could have made a difference we, with other people. We've, we've reached other people in life. And if we're decent people, we've, it's, it's a good life. So that I think he was more or less resigned to the fact that uh, if in the end it was that, that's it. It, was, it would be good enough. Yeah. yeah. But I, you know, there's always, every religion has some faith in a future. Except for well, the atheists, but they were, they were you know. Mm. No, it's... Um, I think we can keep on hoping. Yeah. And then, um, let's see what the community. Well, I think that I think the the you know, some of the stuff that comes out that are, has come from Rome. I pay no attention. You know, it doesn't affect me right now, and I'm not going to let it affect me because some people get all angry about it. You lose you you waste energy with anger. Um, but
but some of the stuff that came that we've been I think that I think I've great I'm hoping I have great faith in Fan, in Francis I think Francis has all of a sudden shocked everybody with by getting rid of some of the trappings that were like the red shoes and all the paraphernalia I mean, I mean, he's a good parish priest, and he's taking care of his parish. I mean, he's the, he's the bishop of Rome, and he's treating it like a parish. And uh, gradually, it, well, you can't do it all overnight. But I think he's the first he's the first pope that we've had that has a vow of poverty. Because he's a member of of, of a religious order. The South America was a good pick. Africa, India, maybe not ready yet, but the, the church and the church in South America, yes. I think they tried to wash out all that was done by Vatican II, and forget that Vatican II ever existed. They're going back to Trent. We have schools in the United States that have put a lot of money, people have put a lot of money into having colleges that are almost trained. But I think, <coughs> I think that the younger people, <coughs> I'm amazed at the young people in this country that are not going to church at all. And I sometimes say, well, wait till they have a sick child. Uh, but the, yet we have a lot of young people who are really very good Catholics. I see the kids that are, well, we have, we, have, we have an awful lot of kids that come to church, go to mass, go to mass communion. Kids that are serving on the altar uh, serving as Eucharistic ministers, singing in the choir. And I think that and that type of youngster is, who's, that's, has a good education and is in church or going to church or doing this and that because they want to and it means something for, to them and means something to somebody else. They're tremendously service-oriented. They all are helping out somewhere and as long as you, if we keep if we can one of our mottos is men and women for others and they're constantly reminded of that and they do you have kids that go down on a midnight run down into this the poorer parts of the city with boxes of sandwiches and stuff and as long as they, as long as, see, I think that the young people today are much more attuned to the poverty that's around them and also to the handicaps that are around them. We thought we had greater understanding with the young people today and they are, they're, they're, uh, they show it. So I'm very hopeful. I mean, I'm an optimist anyway. So I think, yes, I get out of my car, which is when I, I drive still, but I just drive short distances. And if I go, when I go over to park my car at Fordham, there are kids that maybe are, I'm going to the building and it's a very heavy door because it, the place was built for men. It was a men's school at one time. And there were kids will hold the door and wait for me to lock my car and walk over and they'll still wait for me there and open the door for me. And there was a time that, that you wouldn't get that. But we do, we get it. So, so I don't know, I'm, I'd like a few more years. <laughs> if I keep as well as I am, I'd like a few more years. I think the We have one sister that's 42, which is the youngest in the community. And we have, they go up to about 97, 96, 97. 
and I think the median age is probably maybe 73 or 4, somewhere there. So that a lot of them are retired. Some of them are working with uh, Hispanic people, if they know the language. Um, we have one who is superintendent of schools for the diocese of the Rockville Centre Diocese, which is on Long Island. Uh, she's probably the most active in, the, in schools. Um, We have some that maybe give, uh, maybe give piano lessons uh, to some kids that <clears throat> are in the parish. And they're not well enough really to stand in the classroom and teach all day. Uh, we have one sister that's involved with another group in a retreat house. And we have, she has been in retreat work most of her religious life. And there is a sister that <coughs> has retired from teaching and she goes, but she, she's also a good cook and she goes down there uh, two or three days a week to help when they have people in and she does the shopping for some of the food they need and stuff like that. So all of them contribute in some way. Uh, we have somebody that's a chaplain in a hospital. Uh, she's, she's probably one of the few that's still on a full salary. <laughs> Some of them, if you're working for the diocese, you're working on a diocesan stipend, not in a regular salary. I still have a pension because we have a there was a required pension plan and you had to contribute a certain amount from your, your the deduct from and then they matched it and so on so I have I got a, a pension and I sent it out I sent it out to the they I have a budget and they let me have the but they give me that I get something every month for that if I didn't have the that, prayer side, the well, the prayer side is very important. Mm -hmm. I think if you don't have that, you have nothing. You really don't, you don't survive. And I, when I see people leaving, somewhere along the line, they stop praying. And I say that about the priests as well. The priests that, uh, some of them leave. And if you, if you know them for long enough before they left, you know that that's part of the problem. That uh, you, I, I would, I would, I have said to some of them that I know well enough. Are you praying? Are you saying your prayers? And and why why do people stop praying? Is it because they, they, they it loses they meaning? Get, well, sometimes it? I think they can. Sometimes it's because they get tired. And they're too busy. They're doing too much work, of the, and the load, the load can become, the demands, can be such that, unless you sit back and say, "Well, I just can't. I mustn't do that. I mustn't take on that piece of work," because you just can't. You're not a machine. You have to. You have to. Uh, Get to know what you can do, but a lot. I think a lot of it too is getting to know yourself. We can live a long time and not know ourselves. <laughs> well, I think people wear masks, and people can be living together for a long, long time, and they still be they still have that mask, and then maybe. Eventually, somebody realizes what's behind that mask. But I, um, I think very few people tell you exactly what they're thinking. They're, they give you, they'll, answer, they'll give you information that 
they think you want to know. And that can happen with people that are in families and that, you know, you just, all of a sudden you get, you, you get a surprise. I thought, and you say, well, I thought I knew that, and I thought I knew her. And she did this. Well, you know, I remember, <laughs> but one of the, one of, one of the, um, he was the president, and he was born in Balneslow. And he, <laughs> and one day he said to me, I said, whatever came up, I, I said, and he said to me, Monica, we, we choose our friends, we don't choose our families. So, you know, we, get, you, we have to expect surprises. But I do think that, um, and there are people, I, mean, I think in some, like we, we get students that come from India and they will, we used to say, what, what did, you, did you ask him this or did you ask him that? And they say, yeah, but he knows, he thinks that's the answer you wanted. <laughs> but I think more than, it's not just the Indians that are like that. We're all like that. So. I can remember being very worried and losing some sleep on the head of it because of the way, when I first went into secular clothes and some of the nuns were very upset and came to me and asked me to go back into a habit and, um, and then when I was living, I was no longer living in the community, I was in an apartment on, on my own and it was one of the things that was a problem for them. And then one morning, I can remember getting up and saying, that's not my problem. I, I'm, I know what I'm doing. I know I'm, sleep I'm living by myself. I know I'm in different clothes, but I got permission to do all this because of the situation I'm in. And I'm not going to, it's their problem, it's not it's their problem, it's not my problem. I think I grew up that day. <laughs> you know, it's... <laughs> all, and you realize that it's this and this and this and this and, I mean, and if you, if you get to that point, I think that you, you have the makings of being happy. Otherwise, you're wondering what is so and so thinking. I have no right to try to figure out what so and so is thinking. <laughs> and there's a certain amount of community life, even though you are living alone, because there are, we have phones, and you you find out what's going on, and you you hear this bit of this and a bit of that. You escape actually, in some ways, it's a blessing because of some of the twaddle that you're not interested in anyway, you miss. So, so that, and as I'm getting older, community life is, I would say it's easier. There was, I went through a difficult time when things were changing. Like I went to a, one of the houses one time for a meeting and I drove the priest out to this house for the meeting and <coughs> The sister in charge said, uh, my habits would fit you. Will you change into my habit, one of my habits for the meeting? Because I don't want you at the meeting in secular clothes. <coughs> and I said, don't worry. I'll go out to Blue Point. I was halfway to, to Blue Point at the time. I said, I'll go out to Blue Point for the rest of the day and I'll stop by at about seven o'clock to pick Father up to take him back. And at that, she, she didn't want to, So in the, in the end, I, I stayed. But that was more or less, that was the mindset. Yeah. Now you could become very upset 
Or you could say, well, she's crazy. Or she doesn't, you know. And she, that gal is delighted to be in secular clothes today. <laughs> she's still alive. <laughs> Yeah, no, so there are things you can, things that, it's, but I think everybody, that was a, a not an easy time in most communities. Yeah. Yeah. Well, just going back again, Ted, batting in two, was that like, for people who are more, I suppose, like yourself, probably more, more liberal or open-minded about your religion, and was that something too like fresh air to you, or did you miss some of the old Latin and uh, some of the old certainties of? Well, I think that nuns, an awful lot of nuns left communities at that time, or they changed into other work. There were people that were teaching that maybe never wanted to be, or found out after they were teaching that it was not the right thing for them. And, and also, there was an economic piece to it. The nuns were getting a pittance of a salary. The price, and there was no health insurance, there was no pension. Um, the, um, the cost, some of the nuns were becoming, becoming older, needed more, more of this or that or the other, more medicine and so on. And you couldn't do it. it and it was also paying for educating their community and paying for paying tuition. So all of those things took the nuns out of some of the schools into other work. When we, when I taught in Howard Beach, the nuns, well, we got a house, we got gas and electric, we got bare, you know, barely the essential furniture. And we got thirty dollars a month. Now you can't do even well back then things were cheaper, but you still could not. So the thing was, we were we uh, wanted we, we we had a sister that painted, and she would do Christmas cards and Easter cards, and so on, and we'd sell them in the school. Or we had raffles for a, we had a, a, some, some event, some kind of a fair somewhere along the line. We were always trying to raise a little money to supplement what we were not able to get by with. We had one sister sick in, in the community one time. We promised we'd keep her there in the house rather than have her. We didn't have an infirmary at the time. And it took four salaries to pay the, the pharmacy for the medication that she needed and because there was no insurance to help. So that was, you know, there were, there were problems that, and the <coughs> some of those problems were solved in, to some extent. I remember in one of the places where I was, we had a new pastor and he read the financial report of the parish on the first Sunday of January, which he was supposed to do. And the other one read it at the first Mass on the first, of, on the first Sunday of January, which was a very early Mass and very, well, very not many people. And he put it in his best, ne never read it anywhere else. So we had this new pastor read the financial report our phone rang all day for the rest of the day. Is it possible that 11 nuns are getting less salary than the sexton? Um, there was food on the, there, there was food on the list that was read out. Is that food for the convent? No, 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 that's food for the rectory. <laughs> and it went on like that, so that people in the parish began to send us canned goods and stuff. But the the pastors, but it was it, the the amount, whatever the salaries the nuns were getting, 
in the parishes, and they were all getting the same, in the, depending on the on the diocese. That was dictated by the chancery. And some of the, as the parishes grew, some of the convents were taken over because they needed, they needed to take the, they needed room for, for some activities or for some meetings and so on. So they took, gradually took the convent from the nuns. So that They lost. This. I think the biggest, the, the biggest tragedy of the whole thing is that the Catholic schools, at least in the United States, the Catholic schools um, were gradually the nuns were out of the schools. We still have, a, you know, a few here and a few there, but nothing like there was a time when we would have one or two lay teachers, and we'd have nine or ten nuns. We don't have that anymore. I don't have that anymore. But was that due mainly just to drop in vocations? Or was it? It's a drop in vocations. <clears throat> it's, a, it's also a lot of the things that the nuns that are necessary to work with the poor <clears throat> and to work socially, <clears throat> they can be done by lay people. The kids, the, the students that graduate from can do that. They don't need to be nuns to do it. And um, there was a woman that used, she was a dressmaker and a good dressmaker. And she had five boys in school. And five boys and no girl. And she was trying to support the family with her, her sewing. And she had a husband that didn't do too, didn't do too well. He didn't make. He didn't earn very much. But anyway, she I used to. I used to think that after my father died, she did more for my mother than anybody could have done, just to keep my mother's spirit going. She'd come over, and no matter how depressed my mother was, she would have her laughing, and she'd have her, you know, Casey Tyne and. And she, her kids would be playing out on the street, and they needed uh, they needed one more to play the game. She'd put the stuff down, and she'd go out and she'd play with it. So that I, it was, they were poor, but they were happy. Um, of young people that are possibly between twenty and thirty-five, in that group, that age group. But, uh, I guess they got sick and tired of the church. I don't know. Of course, the, the scandals haven't helped. That's right. Yeah. yeah. Scandals haven't helped. And so I think that some people have left the church for the wrong reason. Uh, and maybe someday they'll realize that, I mean, you have, your relationship with God has to go, has to continue, not because of so, what so and so did, but just keep your eye on focused. Well, that takes a little thinking, uh, and some people don't think. 